Welcome back to Plenary Session Podcast. I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Dr. Aaron Goodman, or Papa Heem, as he's known to friends around the world. He and I are going to be talking about the best of Ash 2023, the very best that Ash has to offer. Aaron, it's great to see you. Hey, it's great to be back. It's been a while. Uh, always happy to be here. You didn't have to travel far for Ash. It was in the best city in the world. Is that right, Aaron? Yeah, San Diego, best city. And um, I was actually on call that whole week. You know, I'm a I don't have the luxury of, uh, you know, closing down a clinic for two weeks and uh, eating a bunch of steak dinners, having drinks. So, you know, I worked all week, but I did make it to some of Ash, uh, 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 and it was uh, very exciting. It was great to be in my beautiful hometown. We had great weather, 70 degrees. You weren't able to close your clinical operations for the week and attend, like, uh, all the best trialists? Is that correct, Aaron? Uh, I won't comment uh, for what they do or not, but no, I was unable to just uh, uh, disconnect from uh, the transplant service and uh, uh, shove the work to the nurses and nurse practitioners. No, I, I was there, but I, I made it work. That's really interesting because Aaron, as you know, I was unable to attend Ash because I was also the attending physician on service here at the hospital covering both heme and onc. And so somebody's got to do that see, work. Wait, you see patients? Yeah, it's a funny how that works. <laughs> funny how that works, huh? Yeah, and somebody's got to do it while everyone else gets to go to Ash. So I was here, I was working the whole weekend and uh, I actually worked almost three weeks in a row and I finally got off services t today and so... It's good to get a little bit of a break. No, um, again, I, clinical work's rewarding, but yes, uh, after two weeks, that's that would be quite exhausting. Two weeks, two weekends, that's like, yeah, that's that's when you start to get a little tired. All right, so let's get started here. Ash, the pinnacle, and we got a bunch of abstracts. Let's tell listeners what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about ISA KRD in the frontline study. We're going to talk about Perseus, which is DARA RVD. We're going to talk about Teclistimab for smoldering myeloma. Obviously the place you want to go right in with the teclistamab. That's the game changer. That's no, the you game. the punchline, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk about the Viper study, venetoclax, ibrutinib, prednisone, obinutuzumab, lenalidomide, and prayer. It also comes with prayer. That's all built into that cocktail. And we're going to talk about MOSA, polituzumab vidotin, mosinituzumab, mosinituzumab, and polituzumab vidotin in elderly people who had a lot better options. So we got a lot of abstracts to cover here. We're gonna bring it to you. Should we get started with multiple myeloma? Let's get started with a smoldering one. I think that's a good place to start. That'll that'll loosen you up, Aaron. That's how you always like to get going. So yeah. Aaron, smoldering myeloma, is that one of those conditions that you like to treat or observe? What's your practice going on with smoldering? Yeah, so I could do a whole hour talk on smoldering myeloma or just a one tweet how i treat smoldering myeloma which would be emptiness <laughs> uh, 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 an empty text message but um yeah smoldering myeloma just because uh, i know there's a wide range of, of listeners in the audience um it is a asymptomatic uh pre uh, malignancy uh where you have a clone of uh, abnormal plasma cells and in some of those patients they will go on to develop full-blown cancer multiple myeloma or related conditions and in others they will go on to live their whole life happy unless someone actually told them that they have smoldering myeloma. Uh, and then they see lots of doctors, get lots of scans and, and anxiety uh, induced. So there's a big uh, push uh, in the field of myeloma. Right, We don't want patients to get cancer. Getting multiple myeloma is not good. Uh, um, there's lots of morbidity. So the hope of the field was to intervene early, uh, kind of like what we do with colon polyps. We take them out, you don't get colon cancer, uh, uh, but to intervene early with myeloma therapeutics, uh, such as antibodies, revlimid, to prevent the progression to, to myeloma. Uh, colon polyps is a good analogy because we do intervene on those early. So when we see a colon polyp, you like to give fulfirinox indefinitely until the polyp goes away. Is that right, Aaron? You like to give fulfirinox yes. for the polyps, right? Because that's the that's the analogy, actually, what these people are doing. They're giving fulfirinox well, for your polyp systemic you're treatment. Wrong. I would give fulfirinox with a little cetuximab. Don't we use that? Or <laughs> yeah, and, and and Bev. You need the Bev, yes. too, of course. That's how you that get I'll, rid of uh, it. The, um, the vasculature, I think, if that's how vasculature yeah, works. The, um, the, mi the microenvironment. And no, then one more. Yeah. That's yeah, a great analogy because I've gotten in this debate actually with a friend of mine, a, a myeloma a leader. Um, you know, we you know colon polyps, a small percentage of them, as we know, go on to develop colon cancer. And I'm not a colon cancer doctor. I can't tell you the percent. But with the colonoscopy, you go in there and you remove the colon polyp and problem solved and that won't become cancer. Uh, with myeloma, we cannot go in surgically and remove uh, clonal plasma cells. So we treat them with chemotherapy. Uh, uh, that is expensive and has lots of side effects. And as Vanai just said, 
if someone said, let's give Fall Furidox or even 5FU or whatever you guys use to, to colon pops, you would come back to Dr. Prasad and go, dude, you're crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, right? That's I, I, exactly I'm right. About, exactly right. Like, what the F are you doing? Any IRB would say, you're crazy. <laughs> But 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 somehow in smoldering my alone, and we'll, we'll yeah, we could just do a whole podcast on this. But we'll get into it. That the the it, it's crazy what they are doing. I will go on the record and say it, it's crazy what they are doing in single arm studies. So uh, it's crazy they're what they're doing. Any drug approved that is active in myeloma, they are then saying let's give it to asymptomatic patients, see what happens in an uncontrolled fashion, and then do it again when the next drug gets approved. And one more point to make. What if they were to tell you, Aaron, well, we know high-risk smoldering myeloma has an 85% three-year progression. You're going to say, well, those data come before you started to do PET scans on everybody. And actually, in the current world, with the addition of slim criteria to myeloma and all of the better staging we use to diagnose myeloma, this high-risk smoldering category is much more indolent than it was historically. You've reclassified a lot of those people into myeloma. So actually, we... I haven't seen a really good estimate of what is the actual risk of progression of high-risk smoldering myeloma as of 2023. Well, I'm glad you bring this up. So you're right. What I and patients want to know is, which we have no idea in 2023, is if you have smoldering myeloma, what is your risk over X amount of years of developing a morbid event? Not a hemoglobin trickling down to 11 or 10 and a half, not a calcium going to 11, like a bone fracture, irreversible kidney damage. Uh, um, and we have no idea what that is. Actually, colleagues in Utah, Dr. Mayudin, we're working on that prospectively to try to define that. But you're right. In today's current era, we have actually no idea. So when you tell your patients with high risk smoldering by the 2220 criteria, in six, two years, 60 percent of you are going to have myeloma. That's just not true. We, we actually have no idea. Exactly. Maybe we should do a study trying to figure that out first before we uh, just start treating all these patients. But I have no control. But thanks to the Dana-Farber investigators, we get the new ASH Abstracts 206 Immunoprism Randomized Phase 2 Platform Study of Bispecific Antibodies and High-Risk Smoldering Myeloma. Here's what they do. It's a multiple-arm randomized Phase 2 platform study. I think it has many arms. I wonder if one of those arms is observation, because that's the arm that I think they're missing. Um, I don't believe a, so. Yeah, it's teclistimab. That wouldn't be fun. Yeah. <laughs> teclistimab versus lenalidomide and dexamethasone in high-risk smoldering myeloma. Eligibility criteria includes the Mayo 2220 model. Uh, total IMWG risk score of nine or greater, and other previously established risk criteria, including Fathema. Um, and basically, they give 19 people uh, who are median age of 59 years old uh, teclistimab. So the uh, uh, objective response rate, 100%. So thanks to that full Firinox, those polyps have been blasted away. Aaron, what more do you want? Well, the M -pro in this case, the M protein went down by 50% uh, or more. Uh, uh, and 100% and of patients who are not patients, they are healthy people like me or you, that by some reason were found to have an elevated M spike. Uh, um, there was the response, although the complete response, like the whole point of intervening in smoldering myeloma, at least their theory is, we're trying to cure these patients, prevent them from ever becoming myeloma. And if you're curing these patients, then at the very least, the M protein and the clone needs to go completely away, ideally forever, but at least at least for like a minute. And if you look at the CR rate, I, I believe it's not that high, right? It was under 50%. It was 42% of patients uh, achieved a complete remission. And just to backtrack, teclistimab, for those of you who are unfamiliar, teclistimab is a approved in the relapsed refractory state. So in patients who've had four or more lines of therapy and is, is active. We know 60% of patients who have horrible myeloma respond to this drug. I don't need to run this study to show that uh, 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 asymptomatic healthy people will also respond with a lowering of an M spike. Furthermore, teclistimab, it's a bispecific. This is a legit immunotherapeutic that redirects your T cells to BCMA on plasma cells and results in significant toxicity. Uh, there's mandatory hospitalizations for the dose ramp up. So again, we're taking healthy people, admitting them to the hospital, uh, um, usually for a week at a time. And the two dreaded toxicities are cytokine release syndrome. And Dr. Prasad can tell us, we saw there was quite a bit of cytokine release syndrome uh, uh, in this study. So again, healthy people are now having high fevers and low blood pressures. Uh, um, um, and then interestingly, there were other non-CRS yeah. toxicities that were, and you can read them. There was pancreatitis, grade three, that's legit pancreatitis. Uh, um, and then there was uveitis. I don't know about you, but like I value vision if I'm healthy. And no, I thought you liked Belantamab. I thought you liked Belantamab. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, 
it's one thing these and I'm not knocking to this yeah. I, I use this drug. It, it's, it's, it's better than have, Bella, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it has its role. But the <clears> fact that we're running this study in a single arm population and this toxicity is real. So if I saw these results, I think at this point, um, we should halt all further studies with teclistamab in the single arm space in smolder myeloma. That's my interpretation. I didn't read the conclusion. What does the conclusion say? Demonstrate significant activity with 100% ORR and MRD negative disease in 100% and overall improved safety profile compared to relapse refractory myeloma, which is also the stupidest thing to say. Oh, teclistamab, <laughs> it's easier to give take teclistamab when you're healthy than when you actually need it. Okay, great. But you're healthy. And to be honest, if you take a healthy person and then they walk away with pancreatitis, uveitis, and 75% of CRS, you fuck them up. You fuck them up. I mean, they are worse off. I mean, how do we justify this study? People are saying, we're asking, how do we know they're better off? How do you know they're not worse off? As far as I can tell, you took a bunch of healthy people who felt fine. One of them has pancreatitis. A bunch of them have CRS. One person's eye blew up in your face. And you have no proof they live longer, live better. This is crazy. It's so crazy. And their and actual were risk of yeah, right? yeah, they medic, were yeah. highly medicalized. I take care of these bite patients all the time. Like it's a big deal. There's lots of labs. There's lots of consultants. They were they were their life completely changed with enrollment in this study. And you're right. Unfortunately, we have no idea. I mean, I can clearly say they're worse off. Rather in the long run, there's some benefit. I cannot tell you with this data. And I urge young investigators listening who are going to our wonderful field. I urge Ash. <laughs> We need to continue to really be strict on studies like this. This should never have been allowed at ASH. ASH should have said, what are you doing here? Uh, nonetheless, it gets an oral. And we should, we should studies like this are presented at your centers. There should be strong resistance to opening these up. Well, the same investigators. Pharma's yeah. going to fund it. They give it to more people. So uh, we need to take some ownership here and stop running these studies. The only studies right now that should be done in the small learning space are, I mean, it's if they're going to do it, it's a large randomized study with observations. The control arm, endpoints. Who lives longer? The same investigators are also testing CAR-T and smoldering. And I think they're doing that so that we can learn the natural history with which CAR-T turns into T-cell lymphoma. Because the FDA yeah. put out a warning, and now with the, with the follow-up of smoldering, we'll finally be able to know the real natural history with which CAR-T becomes a T-cell lymphoma. I'll so say it on here and on the record, and I'm happy to discuss with any of the Harvard physicians, the IRB should remove that study uh, uh, immediately. Uh, and I joke around a lot on here. And I mean, I'm honestly, the fact that we're doing that uh, 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 RT cells to, to smoldering myeloma. That needs to end immediately. Completely agree. So let's take a look at the next paper. Oh, this is a, a real interesting one. ISA carfilzomib revlimid dexamethasone, ISA CARD in people with high risk newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. And would you believe that the primary endpoint it is sated? The concept trial is the first trial to test ISA CARD. And isocarity leads to high MRD negative rates after consolidation of this difficult to treat population. What do you think of this, huh? This was a plenary, yeah, was wasn't the, it? This is no, no. This was the transplant non-eligible study. Oh, I see. It's the other one. Yeah. I pull out. Yeah, pull the other one was that if you want to do the plenary first. Yeah, let's do the plenary the first. Talk, talk about. Talk about the plenary. Yeah. Do you have that one? I'm pulling it. Mm. Their search engine is the sh That's the other thing. Their search engine is terrible. I think David at WashU, um, uh, yeah, they should be PDFs and they yeah. should be savable. Like in a, so, yeah, I agree. Uh, um, the, the, with the, uh, the size of that exhibit hall in Ash, they should be able to uh, <laughs> pay for a nicer uh, a search engine for this. <clears throat> no, it was the plenary. It was, what's her name? It was, um, I'm blanking on the first author. Fran, Fran Gay, Francesca Gay. Okay, start search. Gay, KRD, ISA. Yep, there it is. Okay, got it. Oh, here it is. Here's the, the big plenary. Oh, yes. It's the Ischia. Ischia. That's right. And what do we find? 302 people, 151 of the ISA, KRD, and KRD arms. And the addition shows, oh my Lord, no matter what subgroup you're in, there's an improvement in the risk of MRD. Okay, so what do you think? Did you change your practice already? Um, no, so- Wow, again, look, the uh, conflicts of interest is longer right, than the abstract. Longer than the abstract. <laughs> no, I, I think to put this into context, this is the 
for Ash, this is the, the largest meeting in the world for losers like myself and my colleagues where we geek out in hematology. And it's a year's worth of basic science, preclinical, clinical work. And they select, I think, four to five of the best of the best research. And there was lots of good research at this, Ash. And what they chose was a study that did not need to be run for me to know the answer to. Uh, they chose a pharmaceutical. So this was completely designed by industry, written. And I'm sure the, the PowerPoint slides were prepared by industry, um, where they took four drugs, isotuximab, so a monoclonal antibody to CRD, KRD, which I don't know. Who, we don't even use that in newly diagnosed myeloma because Kyprolis likes blowing up hearts. OK, and uh, Velcade is cheaper and just as effective. We acquire and, and we have we have a cooperative group study where they tried to beat VRD and yeah. KRD did not. Be, it failed to beat VRD. It failed. So they chose an inappropriate backbone mm -hmm. and then they added an antibody and then they compared it to the inappropriate backbone and they asked it MRD, meaning can we detect no cells to a certain threshold at one time point? Is it going to be better? And you know, I think for the most part, we all know when you add more active drugs in, in this disease, that's typically the answer. And that's what they showed. Uh, congratulations. Uh, this does not change my practice at all. I, I'm amazed this was a plenary session. Um, I, I don't use KRD in newly diagnosed, and I definitely won't use isotuximab KRD in newly diagnosed unless they show me uh, something, at least make it cheaper than daratumab. They don't, they don't even do that. So I, I, I don't have much really to comment on that other than now we have to add to the illustrious NCCN guidelines, we can add another choice for me to ponder over when I see my newly diagnosed patients. I mean, I think it just speaks poorly of Ash that they would make that the plenary. I think that's the real takeaway point. I think people should remember who are listening that uh, MRD is not a validated surrogate in myeloma. It is prognostic, i.e. a patient who achieves MRD negativity has a better prognosis than one who doesn't. But what no one has ever shown is that Clinical regimens that achieve higher fractions of MRD negativity later go on to improve overall survival or quality of life across randomized studies. That's the surrogate question. It's never been shown. I saw a paper saying MRD negativity is prognostic for PFS. Okay, yeah, but okay, but the question is, is it a surrogate for living longer, living better? The answer is no. Um, that's whether or not MRD negativity predicts a different surrogate rise in M protein, okay, that's not very useful. We need to know if it predicts living longer, living better. It has never established that. Any comments? Well, let me ask a question yeah. then, uh, Dr. Prasad. So you just said MRD, if you get people MRD do better. I don't argue about that. And we just showed a study where you add a drug and more people are MRD. So by connecting the dots, then why, why, why wouldn't this be better? You, that's the argument I commonly hear. Yeah, what, I guess argument the, the argument back is that that transitive property simply does not work. Um, because what you're really saying is, uh, I mean, I think the best example is PATH-CR in breast cancer. I mean, we've known for a long time that lapatinib plus trastuzumab had a better PATH-CR than trastuzumab alone. Pertuzumab plus trastuzumab crushes the PATH-CR over trastuzumab. But when you actually measure DFS and OS in, in the affinity study, uh, when you actually measure the thing you care about, those differences are so small you can't even fit a laser pointer between. Your hand is, unless if you have a shaky hand. So merely achieving higher rates of a prognostic marker does not a surrogate make. In fact, you know, the people you're flipping, those are people who may have bad biology and nothing is really going to help them. They may be destined to relapse no matter what. So I think you're comparing people who achieve something pretty easily against people who achieve it with only more difficulty. And you assume that they have the same prognosis and that prognosis translates into a clinical benefit. I don't think it always does. Uh, it's, a, it's a counterintuitive idea to try to teach people that, yes, something can be prognostic, but it doesn't always mean it's a good surrogate. And I think I would recommend people read more in this topic, look at some of the um, uh, some of the papers we've done. I think a good paper is uh, Surrogate Endpoints, When Are They Useful and When Are They Overused by Robert Kemp. And I think I got a couple chapters in the book Malignant. But I mean, it's a counterintuitive concept. And a simplistic idea is that MRD negative, good, you know, ergo things must be good. Maybe another example is um, in leukemia. I mean, we had a lot of regimens that had higher CR rates than seven plus three, didn't we? But none of them had better clinical outcomes over seven plus three. Um, you, can, you can nuke someone with chemotherapy and you can maybe have a higher remission rate than seven plus three, but you can't always cure them. So, I mean, that's another example. Response does not always correlate to clinical benefit. Yeah, no, and that's, I think trainees need to really, that's something that took me a while to understand too, because it is counterintuitive and super important to understand. And it also doesn't take into account, right? Like, and I joke around on this, but like, 
okay, why stop at four? Let's yeah. get 10 drugs, you know, uh, that's going to increase the MRD. Those time, those, those surrogates don't take into account the tox, you know, at some point, this toxicity of adding drugs is going to overtake whatever minuscule benefit in the surrogate that we're doing. And it does not take into account that. And unfortunately, very well controlled studies can do that. And, and, and I think the biggest shame of myeloma is, you know, we have, we do have a lot of good drugs. We have, um, uh, 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 it's amazing how our patients are due. I have no idea how to sequence these drugs, which is the answer. We need to start focusing the, the research world on sequencing drugs, de-escalating therapy, uh, 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 as opposed to just, can I do five versus four, which will be next year. But let me be honest with you. I'm, let's say I'm a 70 year old guy and I come into your office and my myeloma is the following. I have, um, you know, hemoglobin, uh, 10, 105 ish. My calcium is normal. On PET CT, there's no lytic lesions. My bone marrow plasma cell percentage is 80. My free light chains are 40 to 4, ratio of 10. Okay, and let's say I'm IgG kappa, okay? I'm, I'm a 70-year-old guy. I'm otherwise in good health. And my myeloma, real defining thing is I got plasma cells of 80% in my marrow, okay? Um, are you going to give me DARA-RD, VRD, DARA-VRD, ISA-KRD, KRD? What are you going to give me? So that's a very tough question. And I will say I almost certainly would treat, uh, uh, um, unlike with just an elevated capital lambda, those I have observed, and it's a long discussion, right? This guy's feeling pretty good. Uh, I feel fine. Like. I feel great. And I'm, not, I'm about to make him not feel so good uh, uh, um, or feel uh, worse. Uh, uh, in a patient like that, um, I mean, what would I probably do? Probably Dara Rebdax with a very low dose of Revlimid and a, and a low threshold to stop the Revlimid. Uh, 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 this patient could still do well for a very, very long time. That's what I would do. That's what I would do too, would actually. Do? No, that's actually what I would I'd probably do Dara RD. Um, but, and I would base that on Saad Usmani's Maya study. Yeah. Um, but the point I want to make is that if we're perfectly honest, you know. We don't know. We No, yeah. Wh what does it say? What does it say about myeloma that... A different doctor could give KRD. A different doctor could give isocardi. A different doctor could give DARA VRD. A different doctor could give VRD. What does it say about myeloma that nobody has any fucking clue? Nobody has any clue what's and, and worse than that, Aaron, there is no zero ongoing attempts at remedy. We don't know today. We're not going to know in two years. We're not going to know in five years. The myeloma field is all about carving out more and more treatment, more and more drugs. Nobody knows what to give this 70-year-old guy presented. And he's like... Lots of people, you know, and I could change his characteristics a little bit, gave him a little bit more anemia, a little bit renal failure. Um, you know, at some point you might tip over into, let's say same person, but now my creatinine is like two, 1.8. What are you going to give me? I bet you're going to say the same thing I'm going to say, but what are you going to give me? Same person, seven year old guy, same plasma cell burden. My creatinine is two though. Maybe yeah, two and I mean, a half. so you, uh, you could still do Dara RD or now uh, with, with, or, or Valcade uh, containing regiments. Uh, if he has no neuropathy, there's there's no answer. I, I, I what if my, GF, still... my GFR starts to drop even further? Yeah, your GFR stops. Well, if it gets, you can give Revlimid to decrease. Uh, 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 I would probably give a valcade containing regimen. Yeah. What do you? So, no, no. So then, th that's when I think people might be thinking about maybe a Cyborg D or a valcade containing yeah. regimen or something like that to avoid the Revlimid. But I guess again, again, to your point, I mean, to, uh, to the overall point, no, there's not a single person who knows the answer to that question to say, what is the best initial regimen? They've done hundreds of studies. They don't know the best. They, they, you can't even answer it for most people. No, I think the sad state is, and um, we can't answer these basic questions yet. We're about to give CAR T's to smoldering myeloma. Uh, um, I think the, the, yeah. the money's there, the infrastructure's there, the patients are there to run these studies. It's just going to take people in that field to, to kind of try to reach. But the argument I always hear is, we're so much better than we were 10 to 20 years ago. I, I, I don't doubt that, but just because we're better, like we should strive for like the best, you know? Uh, uh, and I still, I, the patients with myeloma, I mean, you ask them, I mean, they're coming in twice weekly sometimes for a long time, uh, 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 forever. Uh, um, and it's sad. We, yeah. we are better than we were before. Okay. Some of those gains are from the drugs. Some is because they keep changing the fucking definition. <laughs> That's okay, that's, that's, that's part of it. Okay, the other thing is, how much better would we be if we just optimize the drugs we have versus keep getting new drugs? And I think we have no idea. And then the other point I would make to you is, I was telling this story recently on another podcast about, I went to this like uh, lunch and this guy told me about gravitational waves. And apparently like in the 1800s, somebody predicted that when two black holes come together, they'll send ripples of gravitational waves in space. Um, and then the question is, you know, how will we ever 
prove that those ripples are exist like have, are actually it's being predicted by the model and the physics model but how can we ever detect that and prove that and then you think here we are on earth the black holes are colliding like you know light you know millions and millions of light years away and that's going to take millions of years to reach earth and it's going to be such a tiny gravitational wave bumping into earth against the sun and the moon and the tides and the the earth's crust shifting and the the, the truck going by and then for 100 years, these physicists, they fucking thought about it. And they're like, you know what we do? We make these two mirrors and they're atomically flat. They're flat to within a molecule. We put them a mile apart in two dimensions and we shine a laser beam back and forth. And anytime the mirrors move together or further apart, that could be one of many things that deflect the distance between the mirrors. Like the Earth's crust could move. You know, the sun could be getting closer. The moon could be getting. But we subtract all that noise with very complicated algorithms. And then... We can detect beyond all that noise, the gravitational wave. And then on September 14th, 2015, the signal, the thing beeps. And then they finally do two years of calculations. And they're like, guess what? We got it. We detected the gravitational wave. And so to me, I was like, wow. Everybody agrees this is so important. We want to know the answer. They fucking polish this mirror. They build this mirror for fucking 100 years. They do all this shit. And then like we detected this small. Meanwhile, in my Loma, we've got billions of dollars flooding. And people are like, oh, we'll never know. We'll never know the frontline regiment to give. We just got to go give CAR-T and smoldering. We'll never know. Dare RD, VRD, KRD, ISRD. We'll never be able to compare it. You know, so the physicists, they actually give a fuck. And we don't give a fuck at all. That's that's what kills me. No. Nope. The, the you whole that story, and, um, yeah. as someone who loves physics, we chose the wrong field. <laughs> <laughs> I should have been a fit. I mean, it's amazing that I mean, but you know what? The humanity is able to figure that out. I'm still, I mean, the, it just, it's amazing. But nobody in physics profits from not figuring it out, but people profit from not knowing the answer to this question. Because if you don't know the answer, you can give whatever preferred regimen you want. Okay, let's come to the, the other plenary that people want us to talk about Perseus. Where's Perseus? It's, yeah, here it is. Now, this is where you and I may disagree a little bit. Let's talk about it. It's, this, it's this was a late breaking for the, for the record. Dara VRD versus yeah. VRD. And what? There's a PFS benefit. Yeah. So this was, uh, which I will say that many of my colleagues prior to the results of this were already using <laughs> Dara RVD, which leads me to believe if you're giving that outside the uh, uh, clinical study as your standard, you're enrolling in a... <clears throat> clinical study that doesn't use that, that asks different questions. But th th basically they took RVD, which was my standard of care uh, for newly diagnosed transplant eligible patients. Um, and they added on daratumumab, the monoclonal to CD38. And then they took those patients to transplant. And then the uh, one arm got, the RVD arm got rev maintenance and the uh, interventional arm got dara rev maintenance. And they showed an improvement in progression free survival. And, um, I believe, and you have it highlighted, you can tell me if I'm wrong, toxicity wasn't much different uh, not, between the... You tell me, I don't have the I don't numbers. Know. I mean, uh, neutropenia is like 62% versus 51%, yeah. thrombocytopenia 29 versus 17, and then serious treatment-related adverse events is 57 versus 49, but, you know, a 10 percentage point difference, not a huge difference. Yeah. Um, and the PFS is big. The PFS is big. Um, you know, and... Well, you could argue if you're going to go on this route, if you're not a, which I know where you stand, if you're not a DARA RVD guy, then you're also not an auto guy in first remission because that all that is is a PFS benefit too. <clears throat> you know so, I'm not, yep. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, Dr. Prasad, you're seeing him and you're newly diagnosed, you're going to get RVDR, right? Is that what you're going to get in, in your clinic? Yeah, for most people, most people, RVDR, yeah. RVDR, no, uh, no auto, um, and then saving my DARA for first relapse. Yeah, I mean, all I can say is, and you could disagree with me. Um, removing the auto question, the DARA um, in practice and on paper, it's it's like a rituximab. You know what I mean? Like it, it's um, it's not Selinexor, okay? You know, it, it, it's a monoclonal. Um, patients don't usually feel bad from it. The subcutaneous thing is not so bad. There's way less infusion reactions. There is slightly more neutropenia and probably infections. Um, you know, if I were the patient seeing these results, you know, and you told me that this is the average remission and it's that much longer or that much of a chance being longer with the addition of this and not needing subsequent more therapy for, I don't know, I'm okay with it. Uh, 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 that's that's my feeling. Yeah, I think that's what most You're people right. are saying. I mean, are we making these patients live longer? No idea. 
Uh, um, but if, you know, I'm newly diagnosed, you know, and I get, I don't know what it's going to be. It's going to be over five years, way over that uh, uh, is what the median is going to be. That's a very long time till I need to take a next therapy, which will be all that much different in the next decade. The other thing, I think what's more important to this study is whether you're going to give, if you're going to give, maintenance. Here, I'm going to do it. Yeah. The, the, if you're going to give this, and this is from uh, Monty at Utah. Uh, um, I don't want to take credit. The, this is how he does it too. Um, I'm going to give Dara during induction, probably only for three to four cycles. Okay. And um, they're going to get an auto and they're going to not get Dara to map maintenance. Okay. But, but this they, trial gave it. So he's justifying that by what? F by Forte? How did, or by which, how's he justified? La not Forte. How did so he justify that? Um, yeah, there was another study. study in Europe where they gave VTD versus Dara VTD. Yes. Uh, 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 um, and I forget the name of that because I'm not in my, I, I treat and, all and, cancers. And, yeah. And then they randomized to DARA maintenance uh, or not. And then if on either you get it in the induction or maintenance, yeah. but both was no better than one or the other. If you got no during induction and then got it as maintenance, you benefited. But if you got DARA during induction and then got it again in maintenance, they then randomized to people who got DARA induction without it in maintenance, there was no benefit to the additional DARA. So that, that that's pretty good data. Uh, and again, we're not talking about, we're not, these aren't survival. They're looking at just PFS. So I, I am fine giving cycles with Dara during induction when they're already coming into the infusion center for their Velcade, um, doing the auto, then doing Revlimid maintenance. And I, in standard risk myeloma, you can expect excellent outcomes with that. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think I can, I know what Raj and Raj Chakraborty is on, you know, closer to you, your line of thinking. He thinks it's like a no brainer to add the Dara. And I think Mani has got this nice middle ground where he doesn't give the Dara maintenance. This trial technically gave it a lot. So I think if you did the cost effectiveness of this trial, it's going to look really poor because, um, you know, you don't really have an OS and you just have a, a ton of DARA, which is very costly. Uh, there is some non-zero toxicity, but I don't think it's terrible. I agree, DARA goes down smooth. Uh, you know, to me, I think it just, again, speaks poorly of myeloma investigators that this is the kind of study that it, 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 there's no strong... Let me put it differently. I think in non-small cell lung cancer, there's very little disagreement about most of the situations. pdl one comes back, 30%. Most people are going to get carbo pem pem, you know, uh, there's very little disagreement. They have a series of randomized trials that have very strong conclusions and people don't really quibble myeloma. You can quibble a mil, you know, there's just no, no strong data. So I guess if somebody gave Dara VRD, I'm not going to think they're crazy. Um, if they give Dara VRD and Dara maintenance and Dara R maintenance, uh, or how about Dara VRD maintenance? That's what's a Dara VR maintenance as some people will want to do. I will think they're crazy. Um, if they give Dara VRD an induction only, I'll say, okay, that's, that's okay. Um, if they just give VRD like before, I'd say that's okay too. So I just, I just don't have strong feelings as a result of this study. It didn't You're tip right. me. They, they, they could have continued all three drugs or four drugs and probably had a more of a PFS. But then at least the argument goes, you're clearly adding time toxicity, more toxicity. The, Dara, the way I justified it is for what it is, which is not a game changer by any means, at least the DARA is not adding extra visits or substantial toxicity to my patients. That's true. I guess I don't know what it does for DARA sensitivity for PFS2 and 3 and 4, like the fact that they've exposed to DARA early. I don't know the answer to that question. So we'll see. And you never will. I never will. <laughs> I never will. I'll never know the answer. You're right. Okay, let's talk about these brave investigators here. Um, well, this is a very interesting study. They took patients who were elderly, and they call them unfit or frail, and they have untreated DLBCL. Okay, but they call them un they call them frail, uh, but their ECOG is zero to eighty one percent. ECOG is zero to one. Oh, that's pretty good for an old person. And they took them, and the standard of care for these people is, I think, our mini chop or our chop. Even our chop, you can give depending on you know. I've given our chop to seventy five year olds with an ECOG of zero. I mean, no Some brainer. Sometimes I start them at like. Our mini chop is basically 50% dose reductions of most of the drugs, except for the prednisone and the uh, rituximab. Sometimes I start them at mini, but then I go up to 65, 75, and I'm, I'm at full by cycle three or cycle two or cycle four. That's a good move. I do that too. That's called being a clinician and using judgment. You know, I, I just want to say before we get more of the details, yeah. right? This is newly diagnosed DLBCL, an aggressive lymphoma that is curable, mm -hmm. okay? Curable in, in you know, 60% of these patients, if not more. Uh, uh, even though they're older. So any sort of deviation from what we would do needs to be really justified in the curative <laughs> setting. And um, 
they, again, they call them unfit frail, but if you look at the nitty gritty, these are unfit frail trial patients. These are these are all stars walking into my clinic or in the community <laughs> for, for, for this age. So uh, we really need to uh, analyze this with a critical eye, but you can go on. Tell us what they did, Dr. Prasad. Well, you know, they give him the mosunetuzumab and the polituzumab vidotin. You want to talk about mosunetuzumab as a CD20, CD3 bispecific antibody that brings the CD3 to the CD20. Um, it's a it's a rituximab on steroids, so they say. Yeah, it's, and, it's a rituximab antibody basically that brings the T cell to the to the to the malignant B cell, and then the polituzumab vidotin is it's technically chemo. Uh, it's an antibody drug conjugate. Uh, the vidotin is the chemo to CD79B, which is uh, on uh, uh, B cells, um, and both those drugs. Well, no. Mosin is not approved yet in DLBCL, but Pola is approved in, in frontline combined with chemo and in the relapse setting with bendamustine. Um, and they gave this in a single arm fashion and they showed that there's responses, although CRs, right? I think it was under 50%. Yeah, 45%. To I be mean, honest- That's I, not mini chop. <laughs> mini chop's higher than that. I, I uh, think I think I could, I think that this would lose to our mini chop in a randomized trial. I think our mini chop, especially if you're allowed to like escalate dose and the people who tolerate it well, I think that'll kick the shit out of this. So to me, my takeaway point is, you know, people don't like it when I call their trials unethical, but it is unethical. In a, it, it, I'm sorry, it is. I, I'll just say it. Okay. It's unethical uh -huh. to take a patient population where there's a curative treatment and then deprive them of the curative treatment to try a boatload of bullshit. If you want to try a boatload of bullshit, then do a randomized study where you have a futility rule that says if you are having worse outcomes in your intervention arm, we will halt the trial. You can't go against historical benchmark because these people are fitter than historical benchmark. You need a randomized study. So if you do an uncontrolled study, you could be sacrificing 15 percentage points of cure, 20 percentage points of cure. You have no idea. One in five people could not be cured with your bullshit, you know, rather than the standard of care. You will not know because there's no control arm. So to me, these kind of uncontrolled frontline studies, you know, the other one that you and I loved, which was Epoch, Epoch plus Venetoclax in the phase one. And then they took a DLBCL NOS and they gave it to that person. I mean, when you start to deprive people who have curative options of that curative treatment, you sure as shit need some randomization to make sure you're not killing them, um, make sure you're not hurting them. So that's my takeaway. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, with the data presented, if there were truly, e I mean, you need to show me legitimately these patients were not candidates for chemotherapies with anthracyclines. And what was presented and what is available is not the case. And if I'm wrong and these were sicker patients than what I'm saying, please let the public know and I'll be the no, first I, to you know, I, apology. Uh, uh, um, but that's not what's shown. And you're right. I, I would, how on earth can you, I mean, I can't imagine well, maybe this happened. This is just my brain, and I, I'm not accusing him of anything, but you're sitting in the room with that 70-year-old who's got an ECOG of zero who can get anthracycline, and you're telling them, you want to roll on this experimental phase one study that I have no idea is going to cure you or even be less toxic, or take a combination of drugs that has a 60% chance of curing you. I, I mean, like, I would, I, I, I again, I'm. this is why we have, feel free to prove me wrong, but uh, I, I, I find that troubling. I find that right. Troubling. I mean, that's that has to be the discussion. You know, I wonder. It's just because the drugs are new and sexy that people think it's acceptable. But if you did the same exact thing and you're like, "Oh, we're just going to give you two drugs. We're going to give you um, uh, what's an unsexy drug? Obinutuzumab, Obinutuzumab, cyclophosphamide." You know, just double it, you know? People be like, what the, the fuck OC. are you? Yeah. OC, OC, we'll give you the OC. People be like, ah, oh, the fuck are you doing? Like, give them the, our mini chop, your OC. Um, you know, if you take two drugs that just aren't sexy, you would look like a lunatic. It's only because it's, m m you know, we're Mosin Natuzumab. How the hell do you even say that thing? It's got I the- I call Mosin. Mosin Natuzumab. Come on, man. Mosin Natuzumab. Mosin Natuzumab and Polituzumab Vidotin. By the way, Polituzumab Vidotin is such a great targeted drug. The moment that Vidotin molecule is cleaved, where do you think that goes? You think it just goes in the trash bin of the body? That Vidotin molecule bounces around and blows the shit out of all the normal cells in the body. It's These are not really that targeted, okay? Vidotin is a, is a, is a piss-poor microtubule inhibitor. They got sh tons of neuropathy because the moment it's cleaved on cell kill one, it's gone. It's busting your nerves up. I mean, God, come on. AD, uh, this, this... And if you look at the toxicity in this trial, it was yeah. not... There it's was not... a, quite a bit of CRS, and um, I wouldn't be jumping to give this to my elderly population. I mean, you got something that works. Okay, let's talk about let's talk about the Viper. Um, oh, the Viper! You, you brought this to my attention, and yeah, but you need to go through it. I don't I, the 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 Viper. It probably it's a very good acronym. 
Viper. Viper is venetoclaxibrutinib, prednisone, obinutuzumab, and revlimid. I mean, I think, are the investigators just trying to come up with the most expensive regimen ever given in human history? Because you got, you got 200 grand on your venetoclax, 200 grand, maybe what, a buck 50 on your ibrutinib. You got the pred, I'll give you the pred for free. Okay. Obinutuzumab, super costly. And the revlimid, it's still 21K a month. Why I mean, do they, like, why stop there? I mean, they could have thrown more in there. The, the viper with two Ps, a little pola. I mean, they really could have kept going. With a double P with the pola. Yeah. And what are they doing here? They're taking relapse refractory, re relapse refractory, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Okay, and it's a phase one study, obvi obviously, obviously. And they got you know DLBCL follicular. You know, like like you know, we don't have we don't have enough options for follicular, so we need a viper. You know, we got to yeah. think they got a double hit and a mar they got two these poor these poor these poor people with marginal zone lymphoma. They're getting they're getting vipered. I mean, I'm like, it's, it was marginal zone. Just give him BR one more time, but they gave a viper instead. All right. Median age is 57. They got three prior therapies, but in lymphoma, they got another 10 you could give them. Um, deal, a, a single dose limiting toxicity of grade three intracranial hemorrhage occurred at dose level one. Oh, that's lovely. A little uh, hemorrhage there. Um, there's lots of neutropenia, thrombocytopenia. GCSF was used in 92% of patients. Oh, they should add that to the thing. The most common events that occurred are hypokalemia, diarrhea, and AFib, a flutter. Um, and one person had TLS. Uh, the response yeah. rate was 70%. I don't know. Yeah, what do you even CR do with this? rate was not even that. Yeah, 49% CR rate. Um, <clears throat> and there's no way this stuff's curing uh, a great <laughs> waterfall plot. Um, you know, there's no way this is curing anyone. Again, I just want to know, yes, we can always... <laughs> combine things but we're you know, there has to be some sort of rationale like maybe by combining we're yeah I, I just don't understand like this was just literally let's take all these targeted drugs and mix them together and see what happens uh, I, I, that's my interpretation of this study and look at this dude with marginal zone lymphoma his best response is like he did he didn't even achieve pr i mean yeah. can you imagine you got marginal zone and they gave you the kitchen sink and you didn't get pr i mean i'd be so pissed whatever this is this is crazy yeah, I mean, I can't imagine it's easy to give too with those drugs and knowing how to dose adjust when to hold. I mean, I, it seems I, I would not be thrilled to give that regimen. So, um, good acronym. Um, I see no future for Viper. I see no future. All right, is that was that all the ones we were going to talk about? Was there one more? No, I think that's it. Those are the ones we wanted to talk about. Um, yeah, I think those are the ones. Yeah. I mean, I think what's one of the takeaways I have is that like too many people think the only career you can have in academic medicine is to run an investigator initiated like i don't know does it take does it take a real genius to think oh teclistimab works well after four lines of therapy let's try it in smoldering let's try it in mgus let's try it in the front line let's try it with rvd i mean these are very kind of obvious things but everyone is clamoring to do the next investigator initiated study i think more people should do what you do aaron which is be like i'm going to be an academic doctor i want to teach I want to provide good clinical care, and I need to take it easy with these crackpot investigator-initiated studies. They Investigator-initiated studies need to make sense. Many should have control arms. We should take it easy with people who aren't sick and they feel good. Like, take it easy on them. Don't enroll them on your uncontrolled studies of CAR-T and smoldering. I mean, you know, there are other ways to have a career. That's what I want to tell people who are listening. There are other ways to have a career than vipering ma marginal zones and teclistimabbing, smoldering people, like... They're e they're better ways to have a to keep yourself entertained. Yeah, there's there's there's. I mean, we need both, but uh, we definitely need more balance in our in our <laughs> our ecosystem. And um, you know, at some point, I always say like this: what our occurrence is it's not going to go on forever like this. Uh, funds will run out. Uh, at some point, something's going to dramatically change. We need to kind of take back a little bit more owner ownership in our field. And uh, yes, you can be successful, and not be. I mean. I don't, I don't enjoy running clinical trials. I, I actually, I, I, I hate it. I hate being an investigator. Um, you could ask my clinical trials office. They're usually angry at me for not filling out the paperwork. Uh, but I think they're important because I want my patients to have access to doing them. So I do uh, act as a sub-investigator on all of our studies. But I actually find it tedious and quite quite boring and not intellectually stimulating. Uh, but, you know, I will say it. I'm, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to be sentimental. Uh, you can make fun of me. But, like, just the other day, literally yesterday in my clinic, um, I can't give too many details, but someone was came into my clinic who was four years out from their CAR-T. Um, and on our initial visit, 
um, was wheeled in in a wheelchair um, on TPN, and this was a young person, and she looked normal to me. And it was four years later, and she didn't need to see me anywhere. She just wanted to say hi, and you know, I sat back and thought, I go, if I do nothing more in my career, okay, and I'm an awful whatever, this one individual um, is going to live her whole life with her kids uh, that otherwise would not have. And then I thought it wasn't just me; it was all Wait, the nurses. That CAR T myeloma, or CAR T lymphoma. CAR T for DLBC. Oh was yeah, a of course. Yeah. On yeah, TPN, yeah. New, well, I mean, it was like yeah, you 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 cure those people. That's for sure. Uh, yeah. okay. And um, then I thought someone a long time ago had some initial thought to make a CAR T, uh, 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 and that's because what that this patient is alive because of that. And then all the infrastructure and all the trials that went through to get the approval. So like, I am I, mean sometimes. I totally. But, like, I totally agree. Yeah, you know? yeah, but let me give you another example. I yes. had a patient with anaplastic thyroid cancer who was cured by a drug called crilibulin. What is that? Exactly. There are drugs that have, somebody had a long-term durable response with crilibulin and never came to the US market. So like, it's kind of interesting to me that, you know, the idea that somebody is gonna get a great benefit, yeah. that's, not, that's not enough sometimes. Like crilibulin doesn't exist, right? Okay, then let me just make one more analogy. I actually think, and it will, will never know the answer, that if you follow somebody carefully, with modern tools like PET and the labs we do, that you probably can maximize quality of life by careful administration of doublets and triplets, maybe even doublets, you know, because actually the data of triplet over doublet has also got dubious history to it in, in myeloma. So if I came along and I said, look, you can give all the quads and all the teclistimabs for smoldering you want, but if you give me the same coat, if you randomize patients to, you know, Irene Gobriel's clinic where she's blasting them with CAR T and smoldering, whatever, you take the next, you take the next 10,000 people and you randomize them to Gobriol Clinic where she's blasting them with CAR T and teclistimab and telquetimab and smoldering, whatever the fuck they want to do, and then triplet therapy and all that stuff. And then you measure the overall survival of that cohort and you give me the next 10,000 people with a mix of MGUS smoldering, you know, and I go observation MGUS, observation smoldering. I'm also like the slim criteria. I don't believe in fully. When they do progress, I'm more dare RD or RD. Even RD has a role, I still think. And then I give VRD, no quadruplets, and then I give only rev limit maintenance. They give whatever their, you know, you know, Velcade maintenance and, and, and you know, uh, exasimid maintenance. I think it's possible that by using less drugs, no transplant, you can actually get the same survival health related quality of life. Okay, that's my, th that's my theory. Well, I, I, it's very possible. And I'll say this will never be done too. I, if I had to bet, if you did a randomized study of doing nothing versus giving CAR T to smoldering myeloma, you would show more death. Yes, in, yes, yes, in, yeah, yeah. yeah. In, I, I'm, I'm, I'm confident. As yeah. you said, most of the things we, it's very hard to make healthy people better. You taught me that. It is extremely hard to make healthy people better by giving them the CAR T, the, the one of the most aggressive therapies we do in medicine to healthy people. I'm convinced we will show more death. We clearly are going to show more morbidity. Uh, 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 they'll not. I mean. We have to again. We need IRBs to be stronger on this. Why do we even have IRBs? I'm so no, through they're, IRBs. They're they're useless. They don't do anything. They're, they, they I mean, don't. there's nobody on the committee who's even an oncologist who knows anything, and half the oncologists don't know anything. Okay, but then here's the thing. Imagine yeah. that. Um, the other thing I'd say to the listeners who will be skeptical of my claim is if you actually look at the triplet versus doublet studies, you'll see they're very poor post-protocol therapy on, on the on the doublet arms. Okay, so it doesn't mirror U.S. practice. Okay, go back and check that. Check my paper, I think, with Anushka Walia. It's called Myeloma, like a, a thousand randomized trials and no good evidence. Okay, but I want to say this. If we had the culture of medicine and physics, here's what would happen. The one dude would be like, oh, you know, gravitational waves might exist. Let's measure it. And then the next dude would be like, oh, well, you know, well, that's impossible. Like, you'll never make a mirror so fucking flat. And then, like, one person will be, like, working on the mirror, trying to make it flat. And then the other person will, like, push that mirror over. Say, fuck your mirror, you know? Fuck you. You're, you're contrarian. You're fucking mirror. Smash the mirror, you know? And then the other person will make another mirror and try to get the laser. And then they come over to that person and say, fuck you. I don't like your tone on Twitter. Your tone is really shitty. You know, you got a bad tone, you know? And then, like, oh, you're just trying to cause trouble and then the other person is getting paid by like the fuck the mirror company and then they come and they knock the laser beam out of your hands and then like somebody else is like oh you know we shouldn't fund this we shouldn't fund this laser beam experiment like it could actually hurt people like you know these mirrors they could like you know they could shine light in a pilot's eyes and the pilot won't see and like you know there's a harm to having mirrors in the desert you know and this other person be like oh the math you know like you can't look at the math on that like you know we know, we know that like looking into the sky is a surrogate for like, you know, like, you know, it's a surrogate, like it's close enough, you know, and then, then 100 years later, we'll be like, ah, I don't know, does it exist? Not, you know, they wouldn't give a, f they wouldn't care. Like that would be the equivalent attitude. It would be like, everyone's just thwarting your experiment, sabotaging you. Nobody wants to run it. Meanwhile, all the other physicists are making up new particles and waves. They're like, oh, I found, I found the, the boogeyman wave and they're putting their name on it. Investigator initiated boogeyman wave, you know. 
That would be, I think that's the analogy, the culture difference. I wonder if a group of physicists or other fields like sat and really saw what we do scientifically and, and what they would think and uh, uh, how, how they would, you know, resp re respond to kind of what we do. Adam Sifu once told me a story that he was like, gave a talk and, you know, we use the p-value of 0.05, which really means that, you know, if you, if you sample from the null distribution, you'll get this kind of, you'll get this result of more extreme, like five and a hundred times, you know, if you use one tail p-value. And, and the physicist was like, we use, we have like way more zeros. Like we, we're not willing to tolerate so much error. Are you crazy? You know? And I was like, yeah, I think and here we are dealing with yeah. human lives. You know, yeah. that doesn't matter. <laughs> and then I think so some, and sometimes I've been telling this to people and they're like, oh, that's different physics. They don't deal with human lives. But I was like, actually, when you deal with human life, it's all the more important to know to yeah. be getting it right. Like it's not less important. It's more important to get it right. It's not less important. Well, right. You would stifle uh, innovation with your, if you were in charge of everything. <laughs> stifle. St uh, there'd be no vibe. They <laughs> uh, I mean, the argument to that is no. I mean, like we didn't make it so easy to be innovative in oncology. Maybe we would, uh, you know, these pharmaceuticals would be more inclined. Like their their goal is to make the M protein go down for a minute longer. Uh, maybe and then they get their approval. Uh, maybe if we were a little bit more strict, they would work a little bit harder. Yeah. I'm surprised these myeloma people even made it to Ash because I thought they have a, they have so many meetings they can't even they can't even go to them all anymore. It's like every weekend there's the next one. That where are they where are they this week? IMWF. Uh, I, I, I think. Well, I think they're going to Brazil soon. They have their IMWG. My dream is to be invited to give a talk there. Uh, um, one day it will happen. I thought you went to Brazil. Yeah, not to give a talk to the myeloma community. Oh, I uh, like to be the invited, uh, uh, the keynote speaker for the International Myeloma Working Group. I gave that um, lecture at um, the UK Myeloma Research Day, and they played my video. Oh, after you should put a link to that. That was a great lecture. Yeah, after Paul Richardson went, and then yeah. I had a, like a webcam in the back of the room. I could see the audience, and it was like their like heads were exploding. <laughs> I should put a link to that. All right, good to talk to you. That's the updates from Ash. Uh, I don't know. Overall, not too many practice changing. I mean, I saw somebody talking about like you can dose reduce venetoclax in AML. I was like, oh yeah, we've been doing that for a long time now. So surprise, surprise. Um, I didn't see anything my too practice, interesting. Yeah, my practice in really didn't change. If anything, and, and this is borrowing from other colleagues, like I for sure won't give quads to older transplanted eligible. Yeah, my, my, not, not, nothing. I was already not doing that. And, my, sa my and sa salvage auto is gone. That's dead. Yeah, salvage as a transplanter, um, they did a, uh, yeah, there's now no role, in my opinion, for salvage autologous stem cell transplant. No role. Okay. That's a, an applaud. We have better other drugs and uh, less and less a role up front. Uh, but I, so I guess, uh, Although I wasn't doing much of that either. So, yeah, my yeah. practice is about the same. Maybe next year. About the same. And I guess... Uh, it's I in San Diego again next year. Really? Two, no, I thought it was SF. Nope. San Diego. <laughs> and we had a great time. We missed you. We went down to Mexico, had tacos. I saw the photos. Uh, I was jealous. I wish I was there. That was a lot of fun. I wish I was there. I mean, but somebody's got to cover the service. You know, somebody got to cover I was on call. I, Mexico's so close. I was always within 20 miles of the medical center mm. providing appropriate care. <laughs> well... It's great to talk to you, Papa Heem. We'll yep, be back with more you. updates.